Um, it's a real, real pleasure to introduce Anita Sridhar and Alan Gopal, two people who really personify the commitments that are at the heart of the Havens Rights Center's uh, mission. It's a, a combination of sophisticated and analytical rigor on the one hand, with deep on the ground engagement, and in their case, in some of the most difficult and challenging settings in the world. So Anita Sridhar is a public health specialist and physician resident at the Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. In her career, she's focused on the neoliberalization of global public health, such as the rise of contract research organizations in Latin America and cultural and political barriers to vaccination coverage in Afghanistan. She has, in a previous iteration of her career, over a decade of experience as a journalist with NBC News and the Hindustan Times. And she's a co-founder of the Zomia Center, which assists with public health initiatives in conflict, conflict zones, excuse me. Anand Gopal is an assistant research professor with the Center on the Future of War and the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict at Arizona State University. He's a journalist and sociologist who has worked extensively in Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. He's a writer for the New Yorker, and he's the author of a truly excellent book, No Good Men Among the Living, America, the Taliban, and the War Through Afghan Eyes. He received his PhD from Columbia University, and he's a fellow at the Type Medical Media Center. And like Anita, he's a co-founder of the Zomia Center. In December, they published a piece in the New York Times that's related to today's talk, titled Behind Low Vaccination Rates, lurks a more profound social weakness. You can find the link uh, to that article or that piece on the Havens Rights Center website, but I've also posted it in the chat for today. So welcome, Anita and Anand. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. This is so exciting. Um, so I guess I will start us off. And uh, we have some slides we wanted to show as we spoke. Um, I'm going to put Anand in charge of the slides. Um, and just minimize this. Great. OK. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as uh, Patrick mentioned, I'm a physician um, and I'm a resident at the Montefiore Medical Center um, here in the Bronx. Um, for folks who are not from New York, I always like to use the MTA um, subway map to sort of show the sort of spots around New York. And so the Bronx is kind of um, uh, north of Manhattan. It's only about a two mile radius, um, but in many ways, um, as you'll discover through the course of this talk, it's, it's very, very different from the rest of New York City. Um, and here in the Bronx, you know, after the first wave of COVID and after um, the vaccines have come out, um, we're still continuing to see cases of patients that require hospital level and ICU level care for COVID pneumonia. Um, I just finished a winter block in the ICU and I remember one night walking down, more than half the rooms were patients on ventilators. All of them had, you know, the diagnosis was COVID-19 pneumonia. Every single one was unvaccinated. And except for one, every single one was from the Bronx. And that's not just true of our patients. We're also seeing um, healthcare workers um, from the Bronx and who work in the Bronx who are not vaccinated either. So prior to this winter block in the fall, um, a neighboring healthcare system reported that over 1,400 of their nurses um, had refused to be vaccinated and had lost their job. 10% of that 1,400 were people who were in you know, leadership positions. So we're talking about people who are also nursing managers overseeing care. Um, in my hospital personally, there have been entire technician, patient technician departments um, that literally overnight kind of evaporated and the next day uh, required you know, bringing in other healthcare workers to fill those spots before we could start the hiring process. Um, and, you know, you have to sort of see this in, in a wider context. So the Bronx in general has had the lowest vaccination rates out of the entirety of New York City. We have lagged behind in every metric measuring vaccine uptake um, and vaccination series completion. And that has to also be seen in context of the fact that the Bronx was the hardest hit um, during the first wave of the pandemic. We, um, I remember going to, you know, weekly meetings as we were all um, 
taking care of patients on the COVID floors. Um, and literally every metric that was coming out from the city of health, from our own measurements, from measurements from other healthcare centers, we led the charge in terms of the highest rate and the highest number of COVID-19 cases, the highest rate for hospitalizations and the highest death rate overall. And so when you think about vaccine hesitancy, you know, for me um, and for us, the question really became like, how is it possible that for us in the Bronx, who've had a front row seat to the worst of the pandemic, how is it possible that we are the least likely to also be vaccinated, right? How does that come about? Um, and when you take a step back from all of that to really look at the, um, the information um, and look at theories as to why this could be, they kind of fall into three big buckets. Anand, I'm sorry, could you do the next slide? Are you able to do it? Um, this is just a story from the New York Times at the height of the pandemic. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this in just a second. So there's sort of three big buckets that these theories fall medical care. So vulnerable communities such as those in the Bronx um, simply don't have access to and aren't able to get to centers to get vaccinations. The second big theory is the legacy of racism. And so this idea that we live under um, the legacy of the Tuskegee trials, that black and brown patients um, have huge mistrust of the medical institutions, and so are less likely to show up in general on the basis of race to get those vaccinations. The third, um, which was reported on a lot, um, is partisanship. And so this idea across the country that if you voted Republican, that you are less likely to get the vaccine based on that political affiliation. And kind of taking each of those buckets apart, you know, starting with access to care, um, I want us to be clear about the fact that when we say vaccine hesitancy, what we mean is a delay in the acceptance or a refusal of the vaccine um, despite access to the vaccine itself. And certainly here in the Bronx and in New York City, thanks to the pandemic and thanks to funding the city of New York, um, accessibility has not been the issue, has not been shown to be the number one reason why people didn't show up to take the vaccine. Um, I can't speak for the rest of the country. I'm sure it's true for many other vulnerable communities that access and barriers were things that they had to address. The second bucket, which is the legacy of racism, um, if you look at the slide that's up right now, so this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, and according to a lot of their data, this was very widely reported um, that uh, based on race, if you were African-American, you were far less likely to get the vaccine and you were far more likely to wait to get the vaccine. However, if you take a closer look at the data and you actually break it down by class, what happens is that this difference in vaccination rates actually disappears. And so what we're seeing is if you have a college education, so education being the proxy for class, those differences disappear. So the difference, so the, the major factor in terms of your decision to get the vaccine has more to do with whether your had more to do with your class background than it did with whether with what race you identified by. This um, slide that's up right now, if you take a look at the vaccinated, uh, under vaccinated, those who are college graduates, regardless of whether they were white or black, I mean, those rates are basically, um, basically identical. And if you look at vaccinated for non-college graduates, those are basically identical as well. Coming to the, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more slide I just wanted to show. So uh, Michigan did another really great study and they actually mapped out vaccination rates by area, um, as well as education, as well as political affiliation. And by far, when they looked at the data and you look at the mapping, education levels, again, proxy for class in this case, um, kind of drove vaccination rates more than anything else. Um, getting to partisanship, this was also very widely reported, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation um, showed that in surveys, they found that if you were, if you voted Republican, that you were far less likely to receive the vaccine or want to be vaccinated. But even then, when you break down that data, even by Kaiser's own data breakdown, um, what they showed was that if you are an unvaccinated Republican, 
you're far more likely to not have a college education and you're far more likely to be working class. This is the first slide. This was very, very, um, this is from the KFF COVID-19 monitor, very widely reported. And the Michigan study as well, um, the slide before that also showed that when they actually vote, when they actually mapped according to political affiliation, um, it didn't match the vaccination rates or the um, vaccination attitudes as much as whether you had a college education or not. So in Detroit, for example, where Biden won over 90% of the vote, less than half the residents um, reported having been vaccinated. And then from the Kaiser's own um, data as well, or data set, again, when they looked at the breakdown of unvaccinated Republicans, they tended to be younger, tended to be working class, tended to not have a college education. So what this really sort of shows us when you take a step back and we're here in the Bronx is that class kind of becomes one of the biggest indicators um, of attitudes towards the vaccine. And so the question now becomes, why is there that class difference, but also why are working class people um, so hesitant of getting the vaccine? And I think there are two really big arguments here that we were trying to make. Um, for the first argument, I have to start by telling you a little bit about the Bronx itself. So uh, the clinic that I work at as a primary care physician um, sits in the poorest congressional district in the country. So per the 2010 census, um, close to 40% 40, 40 um, basically lived at or below the poverty line. And that was reported as being the highest poverty rate of any congressional district in the nation. What that means on a day-to-day -day basis is that the vast majority of my patients either live in low-income housing or public housing. They um, all overwhelmingly work in the service sector. They commute to Manhattan to work. None of them were really able to take time off during the pandemic. They had to work in order to keep food on the table. Um, and when we talk about public infrastructure in the Bronx, you know, we're talking about crumbling infrastructure. We're talking about no heat at times during the winter. Um, we're talking about people who had to rely and reach out for charity care in order to access hand sanitizers, cleaning solutions, um, and even meals for tenants who weren't able to go out and grocery shop or have access to food. Um, and so when we were doing these interviews around trying to understand what was vaccine hesitancy, there was this really acute sense of people saying, you know, we feel abandoned, nobody cares about us. Um, there's a beautiful quote by a lady who said, you know, we're the last on the battlefield and nobody notices us. Um, and the sense that we really got is that people are unlikely to trust institutions that they feel have not done good by them or have done very little to help them. And to suddenly show up in the midst of a pandemic, you know, things were bad even before the pandemic. I think the pandemic really kind of exposed those seams. But now in the midst of that, to suddenly come around and say, hey, you should all get vaccinated. Um, it just didn't quite, in their heads, didn't quite gel the way that it maybe we felt that the messaging was supposed to come across. There's a great quote, um, another woman who we had actually interviewed um, at St. Mary's Housing. There was a, a citywide program that had been started um, where we offered $500 to municipal workers to be vaccinated. So incentives basically to help increase vaccination uptake. And she said, you know, you don't give us money for anything. And all of a sudden you wanna give us $500 to be vaccinated. What's your angle? What are you after? I want to be clear, you know, a lot of these attitudes are not things that just occurred because we had the COVID pandemic. These are things that have really occurred over years, over decades. Um, you know, here in New York City, we've seen um, folks being told through direct or indirect messaging that they are basically on their own. Um, they're supposed to be responsible for their own health. Um, and that the government is not supposed to be responsible for the welfare of their communities, um, of their buildings. Um, and this, this comes on the heels of you know, an increase in terms of deregula deregulating industry, privatization of a number of services. Um, the Bronx certainly historically, folks remember the Bronx fires from the 1970s when entire buildings just went up in blaze um, and there were no, nobody you know, trying to get access to services to put out the fires or let alone support the people that were then homeless from it um, is a huge historical legacy that hangs over us. Um, and of course, all of this sort of falls under the term neoliberalism. 
Um, there's a fight right now for NYCHA, which is the New York City public housing. There's a proposal to put up 50% of the stake um, to sell it to private regulators and to private developers. And you hear this when you go in to talk to people in this public housing complex, why aren't you getting the vaccine? And it almost seems silly when you ask that question and they're talking about, you're giving up my housing. Nobody came to check on us when COVID happened. I know my neighbor died and you know her body was left there for weeks. Um, but this is what neoliberalism is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to condition us to believe that we're only responsible for ourselves. If you take that a step further, you know, and think about it from the perspective of how does neoliberalism shape the healthcare choices that we make? Um, there's a huge amount of messaging, again, that also frames health through this lens, right? You are responsible for what you put in your body. You are responsible for your own health outcome. We're the only developed country where big pharma markets directly to the consumer. You see a drug on TV, you're supposed to make the decision to get it. You go in and talk to your doctor. We just kind of make it available to you. And, and you know, I want to be clear here. You know, I'm not against, like, personal choices are good. Those are good things. But um, what happens in this case is that it makes us lose sight of all of the other social forces that actually shape our overall health and our resilience and our ability to survive. So my patients, for example, you know, based on the descriptions I've given you, they make choices every day to survive. The idea that those choices can somehow overcome things like crumbling, you know, crumbling infrastructure, um, low-income jobs, police brutality, addiction. I mean, that just doesn't, you know, that just doesn't quite add up. Um, and when we treat health choices as consumer choices, then you're supposed to be skeptical of all of the claims that are put in front of you. You're supposed to question everything that comes your way. You know, you have to do your own research and you have to be responsible for your own health. Um, and that confluence together, when you see it that way, vaccine hesitancy really makes perfect sense for most of the people living in the Bronx. Um, and now the question that we had was, well, how did it get this way? What was it that led to this? And so I'm gonna hand it over to Anand from here. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'll just pick up, I'll pick up uh, from where Anita left off. And, you know, you may be listening to that and, and think, okay, that makes sense, but you, there's also a, a few other factors that we didn't mention, for example, we are living in an environment where the right wing in particular is, let's be honest, is spewing a lot of nonsense and conspiracy theories. Um, there's QAnon, there's um, the post alternative facts that uh, Trump uh, discussed. And so it's hard to, even for me, sometimes it's hard to shake the sense that this story that Anita just laid out is only part of the explanation, but there's got to be something else happening here too, because like, look at the right wing media sphere, look at the way the internet um, promotes conspiracies. But Actually, if you look at the history of vaccines, um, a lot of what we see today about vaccine hesitancy, that goes right back to the very beginning of vaccines. So vaccine hesitancy is itself as old as, as vaccines. And let me just go to a slide here. Um, vaccine hesitancy is as old as vaccines itself. I mean, this starts from the very beginning of vaccines when Edward Jenner, um, uh, you know, uh, help develop the smallpox vaccine. There was already, from the very beginning, there was hesitancy and skepticism in the UK among various sections of society. Uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, you had working class movements uh, that were actually opposed to vaccination programs. Uh, moving to this country, the hesitancy was pretty, pretty stark within uh, working class communities. So this is a little excerpt from uh, a great book by a called uh, History of Vaccines by James Colburn, which is, uh, I'm gonna read a little bit here. Let me just, this. This, is, this took place in the Bronx when there was an attempt to have a vaccination program in the, in the Bronx. And so, you know, people fled from their houses and sought to elude the vaccines. Many of the men and women attempted to escape by going down fire escapes and climbing to the roofs, but policemen were at hand at every place of egress and appeals and entreaties went unheeded. Um, there were so many stories like this in the turn of the century where there was news of vaccinators coming to working class communities or to the tenement housing in the Lower East Side of New York and people fleeing, people hiding their children. 
um, from the vaccinators. Uh, there was protests, uh, there was marches against uh, vaccinations, especially against vaccine mandates, which was uh, something that sparked a lot of controversy. And this wasn't just among poor and working class people, but also among wealthier uh, people. So a lot of anti-vaccination societies popped up all around the country. Here's an example of a couple of them. And uh, you, you see one here on the left, vaccination is a curse and a menace to personal liberty. Um, so anti-vaccine attitudes were prevalent throughout society here. I'll show you a couple of this. This is here is the Quest, which was a anti-vaccine magazine that was around in the 20s. They had anti-vaccine hymns. Um, so vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, is as old as vaccines itself. And, uh, you know, it leads to the question, like, what is it about vaccines that um, sparks this kind of uh, resistance? You don't see that from a lot of other medical procedures. That's because vaccines are kind of unique when you think about medical interventions, because vaccines are designed to protect the individual against a disease, but they're also at the same time meant to protect the community, right? So, Anytime you have a discussion about vaccines, you're always having these two concepts, these two values that are at tension with one another, which is individual liberty versus communal obligation. So when we track the history of vaccines, it's actually a good way to track our society's uh, understanding or relative weights of these two values, individual liberty and um, communal ob obligation. And, and so that, that's important to, to think about when we look at the 1950s, because all of the the, the anti-vaccination leagues, the history of vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy somehow disappears in the 1950s. The 50s were when you had the, uh, the polio campaign. So here you see um, people around the country lining up to get the polio shot. It was considered a pretty miraculous scientific development at the time. And there was almost no uh, organized vaccine hesitancy movement or even sentiment. In fact, the problem was the opposite. More, so many people were clamoring to get the vaccine and there just wasn't enough to go around, especially for poor and community, poor communities and communities of color. Um, in fact, there were a number of high profile cases in which the vaccine uh, went awry. There was one case where uh, the production was tainted and a number of children actually got polio from the vaccine. Um, despite that, there was no max, uh, outburst of vaccine hesitancy sentiment. And that doesn't start from the 50s. You go to the 1960s and you have um, campaigns against measles, mumps, and rubella. Again, these are uh, large society-wide campaigns uh, and there was uh, a lot of um, support for this in the community. There wasn't really any kind of um, prominent uh, anti-vaccine sentiment. I mean, there was some among like religious groups, but this was a tiny percentage of the population. This wasn't mainstream in any way whatsoever. The big complaint, complaint in working class communities and communities of color was that they weren't getting access to the, to the vaccines, not that they didn't want it. Um, and going into the six, 60s and 70s, throughout the country, states one after the next began to institute uh, laws or mandates saying that your children had to be vaccinated against the measles to enroll in school. And so you had vaccine mandates basically spreading to every single state in the union by 1980. And the remarkable thing is that happened without any pushback, any, any um, vaccine skepticism or, or any pushback against people saying that, oh, this is a, a mandate, get the government's laws off our bodies. This is a slogan people say now. Um, and so, you know, again, this is a pretty striking change. If you look at the first 50 years or so of vaccination in the United States from the 1880s to the 1920s, 30s, you know, vaccine hesitancy was central to the story of the vaccine. But then after the 1950s, somehow that just disappears. So wh why? What happened? What changed? And the, the biggest change is that if you look at the post-war period, the, this was a period of massive social programs and massive government inter intervention in all aspects of life. Uh, there, were, uh, there was, of course, in the 60s, you had Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, you also had uh, Johnson's War on Poverty, which was uh, one of the most ambitious set of government programs to try to address the root causes of poverty. Um, you had essentially a, 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 an ethic in the country at the time that social intervention and mass, massive social programs were, were not necessarily a terrible thing. And this was accepted even by people on the right, uh, believe it or not. Um, and you had at the same time programs associated with the, with the war on poverty, for example, um, 
you know, Head Start, which you may know is supporting uh, low-income children uh, with preschooling, et cetera. You know, it, back then, um, Head Start volunteers used to be trained in administering vaccines as well. So vaccinations were kind of um, linked to other aspects that today we, know, we might think of as siloed as, as distinct from, from public health. Um, you also had uh, other programs like the community health councils. These are um, a program under the war on poverty in which uh, local communities were given a degree of decision making power on the trajectory of health programs in their in their area. So there would be a board that uh, would be drawn from members of the community and they would be tied to certain ho local hospitals and there would be some degree in which they could be able to dictate what were the priorities in their community. You know, and this is a problem because this is this is uh, that was uh, that arose because often it was felt by communities that the public health experts often didn't have to share the same priorities as those of the people in the community. So these are the community health councils that were um, uh, operating in the late 60s. Uh, and again, in the 70s, you had a whole suite of programs. It's only in the early 1980s that the modern anti-vaccination movement began. 1981 really is when it started. Um, and the reason for that is because what we had in the post-war period was at least to a, a certain degree, um, an idea of uh, universal programs. That is programs that aren't just targeted towards uh, specific individuals, but targeted to everybody simply by virtue of belonging in a political community. And this inculcated a sense of communal belonging in, in that community and a sense of social solidarity, because it wasn't, um, you know, it was, you simply by virtue of being in this community were owed certain things and had certain duties as well to others as a result. So there's a conception of uh, what we call uh, in the piece, the conception of the common good, which at least was stronger uh, in the post-war period. By the mid seventies, for the reasons Anita mentioned, that idea um, disappeared. And what we had is the replacement of the conception of a common good with one of the uh, ethic of personal responsibility, that we're all only responsible for ourselves and for our own children. And um, we all have to be essentially skeptical consumers in a market. And we have to decide what's, we have to skeptically uh, look at um, scientific claims and do our own research and then um, decide what we put in our bodies. And so what that history shows is that I think one, um, even though vaccine hesitancy is as old as vaccines itself, there's actually uh, ways in which vaccine hesitancy has been overcome in our country. And that wasn't done simply just by flooding communities with ads on like, why you should get vaccinated. And it's not just done by hectoring people, uh, you should believe in science, and why don't you believe in science, or something wrong with you, or you're stupid, etc. But rather, it's because um, there was a spirit that's inculcated, a spirit of the common good, and a spirit that of public health, and especially focusing on the public side of public health, that our individual flourishing is tied up in our collective well-being. And so I think if we want to look to ways to address the problems of vaccine hesitancy, and not just vaccine hesitancy, because vaccine hesitancy itself is a reflection of um, distrust in institutions, which plagues so many aspects of our lives. If we have to look at why so many people are cynical and distrustful of our institutions, then we should uh, see that these are their, uh, this is an outgrowth of the last 40 years of what we've been told. We're just, we're just acting the way we've been told to act, which is that we should just look out for ourselves. And um, there's nobody who has our interests at heart except for ourselves. Um, and so universal programs that uh, inculcate the idea that um, somebody is owed certain things that has certain duties simply by belonging, a belonging in a political community, universal programs, I think, will go a long way to, towards trying to address the crisis of trust underlying vaccine hesitancy. So most for, first and foremost in mind is something like Medicare for all, um, because right now the uh, health system is entirely captured by private, in private interests. Um, you know, the number of studies that are put out in which the people who are um, behind the studies are also sitting on boards of pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. I mean, skepticism uh, in, under the system is actually rational. It makes sense. I mean, I'm a skeptical on a lot of things when, when, when we hear this. And so um, we need to uh, move away from that towards universal models of, of public health and Medicare for all is the most important and also model uh, universal programs that may not necessarily directly have to do with public health, but engender a sense of the common good like the Green New Deal. Um, which I said, going back to the 60s, where there were programs that had nothing to do prima facie with public health, but also but helped um, support public health. And I give the example of Head Start. So I think um, a turn towards universal programs is I think is the only way out of the impasse that we're at today. And it's the only way to, to really inculcate the idea that each of our personal individual flourishings can only happen uh, when we have stake in we have a stake in our collective well-being.
So thanks. Thank you so much, Anand. And and those were really wonderful um, and thought-provoking remarks. We're going to now turn to the Q&A section of uh, our session today. Um, you can ask a question in one of two ways. The first is you can always type a question into the chat and I'll read it out loud um, for our uh, guests, or you are most welcome to raise your hand. To raise your hand, you want to navigate to the bottom of your screen, click on the reactions button, and then select raise your hand, at which time I will call on you and ask you to unmute yourself. We welcome both, and I will be taking questions in batches of two or three. So the floor is open. What would you like to know, or what questions do you have for our guests today? Apparently you both have stumped our audience and they take your argument and presentation at face value. They have nothing to say. Oh, here's, here's Tom Griffiths. Thank you, Tom. Has there been different reactions according to the type of vaccine and its origin? That is the only question on that. You're on mute. Sorry, um, to the type of vaccine and its origin. Um, you know, when we, uh, I think that in, in I would say on, in, on an individual basis in conversations with specific patients at times, especially I think with all of the hullabaloo around the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, that's when I, I most kind of saw people paying closer attention to who's making the vaccine and where is it coming from. But the overall trend, you know, kind of at a population level, um, there hasn't really been, you know, hesitancy hasn't really been more towards Moderna versus Pfizer. It's really been, how did they get the vaccines out so quickly? How are they suddenly able to do this so fast? And yet, you know, half the streetlights are still out. I don't understand. Um, kind of, uh, you know, this idea of like, how is, how do, how does big pharma and how do pharmaceutical companies manage to be a part of the Department of Health? And how is it possible that their development of the vaccines happens so quickly and so radically and so well? And yet you're telling me at other points in my time, I've not been able to have access to medications or healthcare. That's that's kind of the framework that most people have used. Yeah, and I would add just uh, in terms of the type of uh, illness that the vaccines are trying to treat, uh, definitely COVID hesitancy against COVID is much more widespread. And, uh, you know, we've spoken to people who um, have gotten vaccinated, have gotten other vaccines, you know, measles or whatever, and are hesitant um, about COVID just for the reasons that I need to mention. There's uh, globally, uh, polio is a vaccine that um, engenders a lot of um, skepticism. And that's because, um, you know, so there's only like a, less than a hundred polio cases around the world. Um, polio has largely been defeated. But there's still a major international effort to try to go from 100 cases to zero. Uh, so the Gates Foundation, uh, the WHO, and others spend hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, trying to go from 100 cases to zero. And so they're going to really poor villages, places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, where uh, people are suffering from childhood malnutrition and maternal mortality and all sorts of all sorts of problems. And where they, polio is just not an issue for them because, like I said, if there's only 100 cases, the, light, the odds they've seen a polio case in their lifetime is pretty low. And yet you have these big in, international institutions coming and saying, well, we're not going to spend money on all these other problems, but we're going to throw everything we can at polio. And so people understandably are very skeptical and they talk about polio almost in the exact same way that people in the Bronx talk about COVID, which is, you know, what's your angle here? Why are you coming here and throwing money at us? for this disease when we have so many other real problems. So there is a polio skepticism is definitely there. Um, historically, Anita, you'd know better, but I think rubella as well was one um, that engendered a lot of skepticism at some point uh, because it, it uh, doesn't, it's pretty mild, right? In 
in um, children but can, can affect pregnant pregnant women. Is that right? Right. So there, you know, the question is, well, if it's, if it's very mild uh, for my child. Then why should I, why should I get vaccinated? The whole point is because your child might come in contact with a woman who's pregnant, and then um, it could uh, have a pretty with a pregnant woman. Yeah, with yeah. grievous grievous effects on on uh, her child. Devastating effects. Thank you so much. L Laura asks, what exactly happened in 1981 to spawn the modern vaccine hesitancy movement? And Dan, so I'll take two more because that was mentioned in your talk. And then uh, Dan Fitch asks, kind of off topic, but I'm curious about your thoughts on normalizing mask wearing in public spaces and how this varies in different populations. And finally, if you guys can take one more, Steve Katz writes, I believe a lot of the resistance to COVID vaccination and other public health efforts has a lot to do with ageism. 93% of fatalities are 50 years of age or older. Quote unquote, it is only old people who are dying. What do you all think of that? Uh, I'll take yeah, I'll take the first one. Um, in 1981, um, a few things happened. Uh, one is you had at that point Reagan in in, in power, who was um, coming to head after five or six years of cuts in social services, beginning in the mid 70s, and a shift in the kind of um, economic common sense, as it were, where um, the whole the types of social programs that I described more or less ended by the mid 70s. And there was a shift towards a neoliberal model of governance. And so there was a few things that were happening in the 70s. By the 80s, you had uh, Reagan in power. And then with vaccines, that there was, I believe it was CBS, uh, had a documentary that was um, casting some doubt on measles. Uh, the links between measles and other diseases. And that really is the proximate cause that spawned uh, the modern anti-vaccine movement is this documentary. And um, it was mostly among pretty wealthy individuals who are um, uh, expressing skepticism around measles. Then in the 90s, there was a, a paper published by a, a physician that also that made it a link between vaccines and autism that was later retracted and it was shown to be shown to be false, but it, it kind of poisoned the well as it were. And so um, by that point, the, the anti-vaccine movement grew pretty strong. There's a great sociologist, um, Jennifer Reich, who, who has a book about uh, all of this and has a book about why um, elite uh, or upper-class women, mothers in particular, were a locus for, for this type of thinking, which I don't know, Anita, if you wanna talk about. Yeah, um, she calls it individualist parenting, and she really points to sort of parenting culture against the backdrop of neoliberalism and, and class and how that plays a role in it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very similar to what went on and has summarized. It's, it's a really good book. Jennifer Reich, her last name is R-E-I-C-H. Um, and I guess I can take the next question, which is normalizing masks, mask wearing in public spaces um, and how that varies in different populations. Um, I, uh, you know, we certainly here in New York City, I think the biggest, um, the biggest push to normalizing it has really been institutions making it clear that, you know, you have to wear a mask to be able to enter a space or be on the subway or take the train. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but I think that uh, uh, without a sense of saying, hey, this applies, you know, it's, it's kind of like you have to normalize um, seat belts, you have to normalize, um, you know, waiting for people to get off the train before you can get on. There's just a sense of like, at some point, this will become part of that background is how we're approaching it in New York City. We haven't really seen um, differences in terms of different populations uptaking the, the mask wearing, but um, I have seen, um, uh, we, we talk a lot about in healthcare about like differences in terms of um, people who think may, people who think that the mask is more so to protect you from other people rather than paying attention to how much it also is supposed to be you protecting what you're giving off to other people. And that kind of understanding um, can sometimes lead to these really sometimes funny, but sometimes not exchanges. Um, yeah, I just, I, I think it has to be like everything else we do with regards to normalizing behaviors that we know at a population level are gonna make a difference. You know, part of our intake when you get admitted to the hospital is 
Do you wear seat belts? Do you, if you drive a car, you know, um, are you vaccinated? Do you wear a mask when you go out into public spaces? Who are the other people you live with and have any of them been sick? That kind of thing. Yeah, and I would just add that I was just today in um, Arizona and, um, you know, in Arizona, it's very different from New York where very few people were wearing masks and um, it's kind of gotten imbricated into the politics of freedom and liberty, which just like vaccines in a sense, right? There, people view any kind of social responsibility as an imposition on freedom. So it's a very libertarian understanding of freedom, it's kind of negative freedom that a, freedom is a uh, lot having restrictions on yourself. And, um, and so in that way too, I think masking is is the sort of thing which if it had happened in the 50s and 60s, probably would not have seen any kind of protest or uh, opposition to it, um, whereas you see today. Um, I'll just take the last question about age, ageism. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and it speaks to the broader um, idea that, you know, do so, do we owe anything to those who are more vulnerable than us? Um, and if so, what is that? And uh, the prevailing ethos is that we only owe, owe things to ourselves, especially not to those who are more, more vulnerable. And um, I just saw the other day, like an op-ed about how um, the problem with social security is that it doesn't, uh, it encourages uh, senior citizens not to work. <laughs> and even if that were true, that's great. They shouldn't work, you know. So uh, it's just a complete different conception of, of I think, of human life. The, the neoliberal conception of, of human life is, is I think, uh, a deeply damaged, damaged one, uh, where um, there's a different conception in which, you know, we understand as a society we should care for 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 the young, uh, we should also care for for the elderly, uh, but somehow because uh, of the um, way in which our morality has been shaped by neoliberalism, that's not part of the conversation. Thank you so much. So next, I just wanna, yes, Anita, I'm sorry, go for it, please. No, no, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to piggyback off of what you said on it. I just want to, I just want to note that, you know, in the Bronx where um, it's very, very common um, to have people live in um, uh, extended families and to live among, um, you know, it's, it's very common to see grandmothers doing most of the raising, right? Um, or pitching in to help raise their grandkids because there's so many single parent families and or people who live with their grandparents. And so the idea of this ageism, which is that the fatality is more so, you know, it's gonna affect my grandma, it's not gonna affect me. Um, it has a very different calculus when you are the person living with grandma, right? Um, and so I think that it depends on the community when we talk about ageism. I think that yourself and go out there and rent your own apartment, you know, in Manhattan and work, that's one thing. Um, whereas in the Bronx, it's, it's a very different calculus because you know you're going home and you're exposing the rest of your family. Um, the complication becomes when somebody in a family actually gets COVID but is not sick enough to go to the hospital and then says, oh, see, everyone in my family was fine, doc, why do I need to get vaccinated? You know, I'm not going to do, you know, I'm, I'm not putting my grandmother at risk and that becomes a more complicated thing. So I think it depends on the population and the community that you're talking about when you have to talk about ageism. I'm going to take uh, one question from Stack in the chat, and then I'm going to call on two people who have br bravely raised their hands and want to ask you themselves. So the first question comes from Seymour Clear Lee, directly to you, Anita. He says, thank you so much for the presentation, but with respect to your discussion, especially to the class education uh, proxy, have you seen the data that differentiates levels of college education? For example, he's seen surveys which indicate high levels of hesitancy for PhD holders and lower levels for hesitancy among bachelor and master's degree students. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I have not seen that data. Um, most of us in the Bronx are really focused on, you know, education holder versus not because of the populations that we work among. Um, so I've not seen that data at all, but uh, I'm curious if that has to do with, I guess, PhD holders are more insulated and you don't have to, I guess, maybe don't have to deal with as many larger classes. I don't know, but that is fascinating. I would be, I would honestly be curious about, are there also differences between um, the uptake 
with regards to say uh, commuter colleges or community colleges um, versus say you know more private campuses. So especially here in New York, where you know you can take a train ride from CUNY to NYU, um, and they're both in the same city. But what has been the vaccine uptake difference between one versus the other, given the differences in tuition, given the differences in admission? and given the differences between um, whether those students work or not. Um, but thank you for this, this is fascinating. Natisha Tomar, I invite you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I could not successfully unmute myself. Um, thank you, Anita and Anand, for this wonderful talk. Uh, actually, I'm doing a project on vaccine hesitancy with my advisor. I'm a doctoral candidate in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we were interviewing parents who chose to um, seek waivers for their children in a county in Michigan to not get them vaccinated. Um, and unfortunately, or rather, I think fortunately, uh, we had this exogenous shock called the pandemic, uh, which gave different kinds of uh, data points that we could collect later on. And we saw that um, there were many discourses of justification that they used to offer to not vaccinate their children. And most of them were related to native immunity beliefs, which had strands of religion incorporated into it. And they slowly uh, kind of segmented or aggregated towards institutional distrust that both of you have spoken about specific to COVID pandemic uh, related vaccine hesitancy. So I was wondering, did you see any differences in justification processes, reasoning processes of not vaccinating themselves or their family members uh, while you interviewed people? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I think for our um, data set and the people we interviewed, because they were is basically controlling for class and, and um, socioeconomic background and neighborhood, et cetera. So there was a lot of uniformity to people's uh, explanations, which was along the lines of what Anita laid out. Um, um, there, I know that separately from that, there's a very interesting kind of history of uh, we might call metaphysical sort of these people who like, for lack of a better term, new age type, uh, who even consciously or not consciously kind of uh, adopt some of those concepts, which is the idea that the body is pure and that um, that uh, the purity of the body becomes central to the theology of anti-vaxxing. For example, in Germany, uh, the green movement in Germany, there's a, there's a overlap between the green movement and anti-vaccine uh, or vaccine hesitancy attitudes. Um, this goes back to the 70s and 80s, interestingly, um, arising because of activism against nuclear power. And so these are environmental activists uh, against nuclear power. And then against, then it goes from there to being against GMOs. And, and then it's not a far, far trip to go from there to the idea of body, bodily purity. Um, so uh, I think that's definitely the case. I, I would, I don't, I'm, in, I'm interested in what the um, sort of class background and racial background of your uh, respondents are, but I would guess that that definitely is strong, especially among more middle-class and upper-middle-class people, but that's just a guess. Yeah, I wanted to say a lot of what you were saying, I've heard about in context of um, uh, measles and measles vaccinations. And so um, a lot of, uh, I, did, I did most of my medical school in New Jersey and down by uh, the Jersey shore, where you have more affluent families located. There's actually a very strong anti-vaxxer uh, community there. And so um, in the hospital during your pediatrics rotation, you know, they actually kept a separate, a separate wing or a separate row of rooms because they were kids getting admitted who had not done any vaccines at all and were now sick. And the you know, huge massive concerns about them getting sick with other diseases. But the, the refrain you would always hear about was this idea, which is that we can protect ourselves based on the logic of um, the ways in which we protect our bodies and what we put in them and, and that sort of thing. And then when the Disney measles outbreak occurred in 2014, 2015, and everyone was like, oh my God, this can actually happen here in the United States, there was definitely a shift to 
well, that's because you people are all in cahoots together, you know, think about big pharma, think about Disney, think about medical institutions who collude with each other to expose our children to people who don't take as much responsibility as we do, right? And the thing that I think really came out of that for me, you know, this was around the time when I was reading a lot of um, Reich's work. She talks a lot about the fact that um, children's performances and health and behavior really falls back on the mother, right? They feel an enormous amount of stress and it's very much maternal terrain that their well-being is a direct reflection of you and your ability to mother and raise them in this environment. And I almost wonder if um, it becomes a, like in many ways to me, it comes across as a negotiating tool with the doctor, which is to say, I'm not, I'm not completely against the vaccines, but I'm against the fact that you're going to be making the decision making. And I really need to be a part of this and I need to be involved in that process. But it's also something that only happened that I've only seen happen in that community, you know, where those people feel very confident walking into a doctor's room and having that conversation. Um, for us, a lot of even the mistrust against institutions, you really have to read between the lines and pull it out unless you're doing you know, the one-on-ones in, um, in public housing spaces and you're away from the medical institution itself. But I would, I would love to hear more about your project. It sounds, sounds really fascinating. Thank you so much, Natisha. Patrick Barrett, I invite you to unmute yourself and pose your question. Thanks, um, this is really fantastic. Uh, so I, I wanna ask a question that gets at a, a, uh, the historical trajectory that you described or the shift from the 50s and 60s when there was this climate of common sort of commitment to vaccination and public health to the 80s and beyond and the neoliberal era. And what you emphasized was that the role of the government, particularly in the 60s, you know, the role of the uh, great society and anti-war, I mean, excuse me, anti-poverty, there was no anti-war on the government, on the government's part at that point. Um, Actually, though, the, the 50s, you know, that, that predates the Great Society programs. And the emphasis, again, that you've placed is on, on the government um, policies. And I'm just curious what you've discovered or might, what you might say about the role of movements. In particular, you know, the 50s are the, and the 60s are the height of the, you know, the labor movement reached its peak in the 50s and the, the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. And your emphasis on the fact that working class people were actually clamoring for vaccinations and poor and black communities were demanding more vaccinations. Um, so obviously, you know, in the subsequent period, those movements declined and now they're, you know, the labor movement in particular, it's at its lowest peak in a hundred years. I'm just curious what role movements play in explaining the ebb and flow of working class demands for vaccinations or support for them? That's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's a complicated role, I think. Uh, for example, uh, the Chartists, the, you know, British largely working class movement were anti-vax and, and there were um, a lot of working class movements in the 19th century it, it were if neutral on the, possibly neutral on the question, but sympathetic towards being suspicious of vaccination programs. Um, and some of the examples that I gave earlier were largely among working class communities, Italian, Irish communities in New York, for example, or among black communities. Um, so there was, a, a, there was skepticism uh, that was there. In the 30s, which pro probably is the real height of the labor movement historically in our country, poss uh, or possibly, um, still, you still had the same stream of skepticism. This is even as FDR was putting in the New Deal. I think um, a few things happen after World War II. You have a kind of um, post-war consensus towards not social democracy, but a kind of like American version, really light social democracy, uh, which is an example the top marginal tax, income tax bracket rate was like 90% under Kennedy, you know, it's just unfathomable today, right? Um, there was, uh, and part of this, part of, you know, there's a deeper question of why the US establishment turned towards this model post-World War II probably could take us far beyond our current conversation. But uh, my view is that um, it was a confluence of factors of which 
the government, let's say, uh, in, intervention or social programs were a reflection of these factors. Now, what those factors are, some of it might have to do with social social movements, some of it might have to do with um, change in the elite, uh, elite consensus. Um, there's a lot of different factors that one has to tease out. But what's clear, I think, is that there was a new environment um, in the country in that period, in the 50s and 60s, um, and that certainly today, I think the uh, a renewed labor movement could go a long way. I mean, to, to fighting for the types of universal programs that that I described. It's hard to imagine those programs coming about without uh, working class people um, fighting for them. So, in that sense, I think today for universal programs, they're they're, they're pretty pretty central. Uh, from Susang zero five. Uh, Susong05 writes, hi from Scotland, we are lucky to have a national care provider free at the point of delivery here, but we still see lower uptake in deprived areas. I'm so interested in your highlighting of the shift over the years to neoliberalism and also to the distrust of institutions due to the perceived lack of support in areas that impact on health. We have seen a lot of income support cuts in the last 10 years and a reduction in state support. And I now wonder if that is a link. So thanks so much to Susang05 for that comment. Um, um, Marcia Morales uh, writes, wondering what your perspective is on the role trusted messengers, examples like community health workers and promotoras de salud, et cetera, and their impact to improve vaccine hesitancy, especially in BIPOC communities. And finally, uh, Pete Remand writes, hi, there seems to be a somewhat authoritarian response from some liberal quarters. A poll from last year of Democratic Party voters suggested that almost half of Democrats polled through state and federal governments should be allowed to either fine or imprison those who publicly question vaccine efficacy. 45% of Dems who took the poll were in favor of government forcing people who refused the vaccine to live in designated facilities or locations. And 29% of Democrats who took the poll reportedly said that they would be in support of parents who are against getting vaccinated, losing custody of their children. I'm not sure of the validity of the poll. It was commissioned by a free market think tank but it points towards the polarized way in which in and out groups are being formed by people on the left. Do you think this is a real trend? And if so, what are the implications given the correlation between non-vaccine uptake and working class communities? You can take that those in whatever order you'd like. Yeah, those are, wow, those are really good questions. Um, thank you also to the person from Scotland. That's fascinating um, to read about and to hear about. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, starting with the community healthcare workers, um, we've, um, the, the sort of the role of the quote unquote trusted messenger, um, I will say, you know, we've, we've really employed that as the primary role and the primary way of trying to get into communities and trying to increase vaccine uptake in the Bronx. Um, on one, you know, it's, 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 I think it's so important because um, certainly, you know, the, it, it's not just the message, it's the messenger that really matters. And in a lot of communities, especially ours, and given the distrust between the medical institution and the, the populations you're trying to work in, um, the idea that somebody can help bridge that gap that's outside of either of those two roles, I think is, is so important. With that said, I will say it gets complicated because it can also be seen as um, trying to co-opt members of the community. And so there's been feedback at various points where it's now you're just making people come in and say what it is that you wanted to say to me and you're using them to spread your messaging. I still don't trust the vaccine. And I think that there's this tightrope that institutions have to walk and have to do a better job at, which is saying that if you're going to employ community healthcare workers and you're going to employ or you're going to have trusted messengers, they have to be given a seat at the table. And what that means is not just that they're coming in and spreading the messaging, that they are themselves going to be able to bring back criticisms, feedback, um, you know, points to the institutions and to the people themselves and say, you're not doing this right. And by the way, here's what the community is saying about all the other stuff that you're doing. 
that's a really tough role to take on. That's a lot to take on. And we're not set up, you know, in so many instances, we're so siloed even within healthcare and we're so problem oriented. It's just about vaccine uptake. And then the moment you have a community healthcare worker who comes to the table and says, by the way, the vast majority of my conversations today were not about the vaccines, it's about housing. It just becomes, you know, it just sort of opens up this Pandora's box that we're not, we're not really equipped and able to deal with. Um, the most successful example of the community healthcare worker program I've seen so far is actually at Rikers Island. So Rikers Island is this massive prison system. Um, they have been, there's a lot that's been written about the way that the pandemic has affected Rikers. It's not doing well, as you can imagine. Um, doctors and healthcare workers there are up in arms um, all the time. And um, people have not, because of the outbreak and the way that it's worked, as people have tested positive for COVID, there's there's quarantine effects that have been put into place in various parts of the prison housing. So people aren't even able to leave that area um, and access other areas of the prison. They employed, um, it's called like the adult, I forget what it's called exactly, but it's basically a community healthcare worker program. So it's young men who come in, work with healthcare providers, actually go out into these areas of housing to speak to people and then come back. And the reason it works is because the healthcare providers themselves have recognized a lot of what we have to do to start with is not go out there and talk about vaccines, but just let people talk and bring all of that information back to the table and really sit there and grapple with how much has failed and how much we're failing at doing and managing this pandemic and how much more needs to be done. Um, and it's hard. It's such hard work and it's so much, but I think it's made the biggest impact and the biggest difference um, to getting people to feel like, okay, you're listening. Okay, maybe there's hope here. Maybe there's something here that I can move forward with to work with you rather than just being told, oh, now I have to take a vaccine in addition to everything else that's happening. Sorry if that was a longer response, but um, yeah. Um, Anand, do you want to do the authoritarian uh sure i mean that i didn't know those about those polls um i guess i'm not surprised it's pretty horrifying i think um <laughs> i think it, it it mirrors um an attitude that we see sometimes among uh liberals especially like uh, elite liberals where they want to blame people who are hesitant uh, about taking the vaccine and not try to understand the reasons why. And if you actually try to listen to what people say, you know, there's a rationale there. It's not crazy. It's it's there's something that there's a there's a reasoning there that uh, at least makes sense within the context of where these people are coming from. And uh, I think that has to be the starting point to thinking about solutions. And so, um, but you know, the kind of solutions that we've laid out here um, are pretty large structural ones. Um, that have to do with the core of it, a redistribution of wealth. Um, the, you know, I don't see how we could um, really address the issue without actually trying to tackle inequality and poverty and all these other things. So these are all these are big issues uh, that um, I think some of the people, at least, who some of the liberals, at least, who um, are having these kinds of views perhaps maybe have a vested interest in not really pursuing. So um, we're talking about massive redistribution of wealth and government programs, et cetera. And you can see why among um, one wing of the Democratic Party and some certain types of liberal elites that that's something that they're not interested in doing. So that's um, my answer to that. But that is a frightening thing that people think that. I just want to say, you know, working class communities, and we see this especially in the Bronx, like women are already having their kids taken away from them, right? Like black and brown mothers, especially single moms, are already criminalized in ways that other women are not. Um, and it's a constant fight to keep your kids. It's a constant fight even when you have your kids to even put food on the table, to get them to school every day, to um, even with the pandemic ongoing, have internet access, you know, navigate a Zoom, a classroom session. Like, um, and it's, it's insane. It's insane how much we blame the moms for this, whereas, so much of this could be accommodated and you know fixed if we were to say, hey, what about ways of making sure people have like internet access or what about ways of making sure the kids get three meals a day 
even when they're home versus at school. Um, and so this, this makes me feel like the, the, the tone of this really makes me feel this is an extension of the ongoing conversations that are already happening in the background with or without the pandemic about look at those welfare queens, you know, look at the way they raise their kids. They would be so better off if we took away their children. I don't know. That's my, that's my feel to it. I don't think penalizing and criminalizing people like criminalizing people for not taking the vaccine, I think is the biggest mistake we could make. The biggest mistake. This will, this, I mean, you talk about Black Lives Matter, you talk about the anger that's palpable during those demonstrations. So much of that makes me think about what would happen if you ended up like criminalizing people for, for not engaging in this. Leslie C., you're welcome to ask your question. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you so much to the excellent speakers and brilliant discussion. This is probably one of the best meetings on the topic I've ever been to. Um, I'm Scotland, as you can probably tell from my accent, and um, I'm a member of the working group of Zero Covid Scotland, which is part of the Zero Covid UK campaign. And I find it very interesting that um, I've had discussions with people who are quite fanatically anti-vaccine, although they're not the kind of conspiracy theorists. They're not the real. They're, they're just people who quite understand that they don't trust our government. And can you blame them when we've got the likes of Bojo, Partygate? You might have heard of that, the Downing Street parties during lockdown. Um, and the thing I find is that you know they we we agree that they we don't trust the powers that be. We don't trust the establishment. We've just come to somewhat different conclusions. Uh, the question I wanted to ask though was that there has been some success in uh, some of the more marginalised communities that we have in Scotland. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, uh, Muslim community who are sadly subject to some degree of Islamophobia, which is a national shame. There have been initiatives involving faith leaders uh, and that seems to have actually helped to encourage to take up a vaccination for I think the, the reason that if people are hearing the message from somebody that they trust, somebody is the same colour of skin as them, uh, this would maybe make them slightly less understandably sceptical of the motivation of our government for, and I should say governments because the Scottish government is a bit better than Bojo's but <laughs> I'm not a flag waver for, for it. Um, I wonder if that is something that has been attempted in the Bronx and in other areas. Sorry if that was a bit of a ramble. Thank you again. Thank you, Leslie. Anita, you want to talk about the Jehovah's Witness uh, community? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Um, so in the Bronx, we have a very, very large um, Jehovah's Witness uh, population. Um, very, very uh, and very, very, um, I, I, I don't know what the right word is, very interwoven, meaning um, the church communities that form around them are very tight knit. Um, they were one of the ones that survived the pandemic the best because their social networks were so close and they very quickly figured out ways to get medications, access to hospitals, um, food to members of that community. And um, honestly, I mean, you're right. The, the biggest uptake of vaccines in that community has been that somebody, we don't know who, we're very thankful to them. We're trying to figure out who it is. Somebody spoke to the main church and all of the pamphlets and talks that then came out encouraging members to vaccinate literally was like overnight. I had patients who overnight for weeks and months had not gotten the vaccine. And then all of a sudden just showed up on a Monday morning and I was like, oh, you're here. We didn't have an appointment. And they're like, no, we're here to get the vaccine. By the way, I brought 10 other people from the church with me. Um, so you're right. It's, uh, I, I do think that they are unique though. And it sounds like they're very similar to the, to the communities you've talked about in Scotland in that um, you know, the faith leaders and the community themselves are very close. Um, and that they rely on each other for information and that there's a, a sensibility of a, a collective approach to these things. We have not necessarily had as much luck among other communities um, in the Bronx. And we think that that might have to do with um, not so much a lack of trust or faith, but those ties within that community are not as strong. So 
um, maybe the, the sharing of social information um, gets diluted from other social networks that people are part of. Um, we've also tried, um, other, other than the religious uh, leaders, we've also tried kind of um, influencers in the, in the communities themselves. And so folks who we know have had um, a big impact on um, the way that information is spread around um, immigration issues, um, you know, where the best West African grocery stores are for spices and that sort of thing, and actually pulling them in as well and saying, you know, in your WhatsApp grouping, could you make sure you talk about vaccines and vaccinations? But it's, it's a tricky thing to do because it also depends on, um, you know, we've had one influencer who basically said to us, listen, nobody in my community wants to get the vaccine. You know that and I know that. Why are you putting me in this position? And we've had other influencers who say, okay, but if I do this, you know, they're going to ask me how much is Montefiore paying me? So how much are you paying me? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting, but we've, we've definitely, we've de the Jehovah's Witness community, I think has been the biggest, um, uh, the biggest example of that. Thank you. Nigel Carter writes, to what extent do government vaccine mandates contribute to vaccine hesitancy. The UK government made it mandatory for social care workers to have the COVID vaccine with the intention for health workers to also be subject to mandatory vaccination. UK trade unions representing social care workers, health workers, and other frontline workers call for education and persuasion rather than coercion and compulsion as reflected in the UK government mandatory vaccine policy, which was eventually abandoned, but not before many thousands of social care workers workers lost or left their jobs due to the vaccine mandate? Yeah, I think, um, so certainly today, vaccine uh, government mandates are contributing to vaccine hesitancy, even as they are forcing people who wouldn't have otherwise gotten vaccinated to get vaccinated. So it's hard to weigh those two against each other to see which is a greater community. Um, you know, a lot of the studies that we were citing were coming from um, about a year ago, maybe, or about early early summer, before mandates really took root, and you saw that pe the number of people saying they wouldn't get vaccinated was much higher than those who eventually got vaccinated. And we probably think probably some of those are due to the mandates. Um, but historically, it's not necessarily the case that mandates lead to to vaccine hesitancy. As I said, um, you know, you had school mandates uh, across. The country that you couldn't enroll your kid in school if they weren't vaccinated and that was accepted all the way through there was no real vaccine hesitancy around that um you had um also other government mandates in pre previous times in history that were accepted so the government can mandate all sorts of things from wearing seatbelts etc so the question of whether um people are going to accept that or not hinges on a lot of other issues like trust and our ideas of individual liberty versus communal obligation etc Thanks very much. I do have a question uh, myself um, regarding um, the participation of private industry in the manufacture or even before manufacture, the creation of vaccines. I'm curious if over time, just as you said, um, your, your argument about the connection or the correlation of deep uh, social spending um, in the, the post-war period up until the 80s, if you've also seen a change in the in the degree to which or the extent to which private industry was invited to participate in the creation, manufacture, and then distributions of vaccines, it seems to me that um, warp speed was very much relying on private for-profit companies. And I'm curious if the US government has always relied on private entities to do that sort of work, or if um, publicly funded institutions were more active in that, uh, that effort. That's a good question. Um, it's instructive to compare, for example, the polio uh, development of polio and the COVID vaccine. So for polio, um, all of the research there was was publicly, well, it was not just publicly funded. There was two forms of funding. One was uh, from the government, but there was also the March of Dimes, uh, which was a charity um, and that was uh, that collected millions of dollars from people around around the country. And the the I, one of the animating ideas behind that among the founders was that they didn't want public funding of research because they felt that was too socialistic. 
Um, and so they were major donors to the development of the vaccine, but the vaccine was developed at universities and at research institutes. You know, Jonas Salk was at a university or research. These are all, so in some ways they were connected to the public. So if it wasn't directly publicly funded, it was at least developed in a kind of public NGO, NGO partnership. Um, what happened once, and so, by the way, Salk, after he, after he produced the vaccine, famously said that um, he's not going to, um, he's, he's going to give it away for free because he said, how can you, can you patent the sun? I think was his phrase. How can you patent this is nature? Um, but what the government did at that point is the production of the vaccine was, was given to private, private industries, private companies. So I think six or seven companies. Um, so that's, and that's been part of the way the U S has been doing it from the beginning. And it was very consciously done always because they thought that any kind of public production would be socialism. Uh, what's, new in this case is not just the production, but the entire research, everything was done through private companies, but with plenty of public funding, right? A lot of, these are private companies that basically benefited from their own type of corporate socialism and got a lot of money from, from the US government uh, to do this. So uh, it's a, not, I don't think it's a major change, but it is a distinction. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we have uh, time for just one more question and then I'll invite both of you to offer any concluding remarks. But the final question, it comes from Judy Sulik who actually uh, posted it very early in the discussion, uh, but it seems fitting uh, to ask towards the end. Uh, do you see any hope that society will change in regards uh, to this issue and similar ones going forward? Anita? You know, I think you have to have hope, right? Um, I, I don't know that it's possible to do this work and to, to go in every day and to see and to hear all of these stories and not have hope that, uh, that things will change and that the struggles that um, communities are having um, will succeed in some way. Um, I, um, yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. I will. I will say that there is, uh, you know, we we recently had the 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 Amazon win for um, the union. Um, I think that rippled across the Bronx, you know, in ways that were uh, that were huge. Um, my patients, my coworkers, everybody was talking about it um, because there's a real sensibility and a real recognition that, um, you know, that we. We're, we're not going to win anything and nothing's going to change unless people participate and people um, come together to make those changes possible. How that's going to move forward from here, I don't know. That's the part that's tricky, I think, to answer. Yeah, I mean, we need to reimagine the social compact in our country. And I agree that if there's any daylight, it's what happened in Staten Island with Amazon workers or with Starbucks workers in 19 or 20. 19 of 20, I think, or something have been unionized. And there's um, a, a rising, uh, Patrick asked about the labor movement. This is like the last couple of years for the first time, we see some signs of life in the labor movement. And the labor movement doesn't just represent the people in those industries, but they represent a different way of thinking about what we owe each other. Um, they, they represent an idea of a common good. And so there's some hope there. And um, I think we should hold on to that. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, Sridhar and Anand Gopal for a really thought-provoking uh, discussion today and um, reflections. I would invite all of you to check out a listing of all of our events on the Havens Rights Wisconsin Havens Rights Center for Social Justice website um, to find out more about our future lectures and the films we're showing for social cinema. Again, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we really appreciated uh, your time and we hope to see you again soon. So until then, be well. Take care. Thank you so much.